Star Destroyers are most commonly known for their extensive use in the Imperial Navy. Due to the amount of resources the Emperor had at his disposal, the Empire and others would develop numerous variations on these battleships. Some would be developed in secret, and others were just ineffective. In this video, we'll be ranking Star Destroyers not just from the Empire, but throughout the galactic history in Empire War. Before we get started, we'll be basing the tier list based on these parameters. 1. The ability to hold orbit above a planet without reinforcements. 2. The overall firepower. and 3. The ease of production. While many Star Destroyers are specialized variants of the ISD-1, the main function of the Star Destroyer was to carry an entire fleet's firepower in a single ship. Therefore, most Star Destroyers came with hangars as well as laser cannons to hold off vessels too small for turbo lasers to hit. So, for the purpose of this video, even if a ship has overwhelming firepower, its inability to hold off a small invasion force will count against it in the ranking. And finally, here is what the ranks represent. D rank is for vessels that are not optimized for solo survival. C tier are average performing, B tier is better but still has flaws, A tier is near perfect, and S tier is the theoretically best ship to use against an entire battle group. Now, let's get on to the list. Going in chronological order, the first Star Destroyer on this list is the Venator Star Destroyer used by the Galactic Republic during the Clone Wars. This craft was designed to be a larger and more effective acclimator cruiser. Although the Venator is a little more than half the size of an ISD, it is still well armoured and shielded for its size. It carries a variety of weapons, ranging from torpedo launchers to laser cannons. Its main battery consists of eight separate dual turbolaser barbettes meant for bombarding capital ships from head on. It also boasts an impressive hangar of nearly 400 light starfighters that can be deployed rapidly. Its adaptable weapons loadout and fighter complement gives the Venator Star Destroyer significant flexibility in battle and can hold its own against most hostiles. Due to its ease of production, ability to engage a variety of attackers at once, and its relatively good armament, the Venator wins a very high place in the C tier. The next vessel was made to replace the Venator, sacrificing some anti-fighter capability in order to double down on firepower. That's right, the Victory 1 Star Destroyer may have been slightly smaller than the Venator, but it was able to hold its own against even larger ships. It was also able to keep small ships from escaping with its tractor beams. The Victory 1 Star Destroyer was designed as an anti-capital ship. Along with its upgraded shields and armor, its weapon systems are much more focused on hitting larger, hard targets. Its impressive array of missile launchers could easily outdamage comparable ships from the era it was designed for, the Clone Wars. Even after significant advancements in technology, the Victory 1 Star Destroyer would remain a prized ship even after the fall of the Empire. But its weaknesses include its lackluster precision targeting and a small hangar that only holds around 40 fighters. Its tractor beam may be useful against a single target, but it's unlikely any single small craft would attack this ship. This is also a significant downgrade from the Venator. Although the Victory 1 is not as flexible as the Venator Star Destroyer, it still serves as a formidable obstacle. But due to its relative ease of production and significant firepower, it still remains the top spot in the C tier despite its age. The Secutor Star Destroyer had the length of two Venators and was made comparatively wide to allow for larger hangars. The Secutor was undergunned for its size, housing only a moderate amount of anti-capital ship weapons. Its shielding and armor did provide significant survivability, however, as this ship was meant to be the command vessel. Thanks to its massive hangars and advanced sensors, it could fulfill the role as a fleet's flagship by providing over a hundred fighter craft and communications. The Secutor was meant to support an entire fleet, but that does not mean it is useless by itself. 
Moderate offense, significant fighter presence, and capable shielding would see this ship go into service well after the Galactic Civil War. And because of all of its capabilities, the Secutor deserves the rank of High B tier. The next Star Destroyer is the smallest one to make the list. It was initially designed to be an escort to the Victory One, but after the rise of the Empire and the adoption of the first iteration of the ISD, this ship was no longer needed for escort duty. It is none other than the Gladiator Star Destroyer, and it comes in at half the size of a Venator. Since this ship was designed too early and deployed too late, the Gladiator would patrol systems that were deemed not important enough to require an ISD. Since this ship was originally designed to escort larger ships, it still has an assortment of weapons to deal with most situations, including a tractor beam. Although the Gladiator is about 30% smaller than the Victory One, it holds a similar amount of starfighters. This comes at the cost of frontline survivability, however. Although the Gladiator is extremely well-rounded, it does not have the shielding nor firepower to roll over enemies like most Star Destroyers. But what the Gladiator lacks in brute force, it makes up for in precision. This Star Destroyer is the fastest and most maneuverable in the Empire. It carries nearly a dozen missile launchers, 12 highly accurate turbo lasers, and multiple anti-fighter guns. Not to mention, the hangars are large enough to include bombers, which can drastically increase the amount of damage the Gladiator could provide. Although the Gladiator is not the most well shielded or widely available, it can still cause significant damage. Our verdict, the top spot of the worst category, a high D tier. Next up is the Victory 2 class Star Destroyer. The Victory 2 retains the armor and hangars of its predecessor, but substitutes its missile launchers and tractor beams for impressive iron cannon batteries. The engines were also upgraded for faster top speeds. Its anti-fighter capabilities was also reduced in favor of more turbo lasers, doubling down once again as a capital ship destroyer. Although more powerful than the Victory 1, the Victory 2 is just less flexible. The lack of missile launchers makes it difficult for the ship to deal damage after taking out shields, making this ship extremely niche when it's just more expensive than a Victory 1 and therefore its predecessor just works better in most situations. But despite those drawbacks, the base stats the Victory 2 offers does make it better than its predecessor. And for those reasons, the Victory 2 Star Destroyer secures the lowest spot on the B tier. Now we come to the real ship of the line, holding twice as many fighters of a Victory, twice as many guns as a Venator, and more shielding than both vessels combined is none other than the Imperial Star Destroyer Mark I. Also known as the ISD-1, the Imperial Star Destroyer was the result of a massive push of militarization by the galaxy's new emperor. The ISD-1 was triple the size of a Victory Star Destroyer and was better well-rounded. The size of the ship allowed for significantly more guns, which increased its anti-capital firepower while also augmenting its defense against small craft. The sensor array was upgraded too, meaning surprise attacks against these warships would be more difficult to pull off. Its main turbo laser battery consisted of six dual heavy turbo laser and two dual heavy iron cannon barbettes. Although the number of turbo lasers in its main armament is the same as the Venator, the ISD-1 had larger guns and more secondary weapons to hammer away at hostiles. During the development of the ISD-1, the manufacturers, Kuat Drive Yards, elected to sacrifice ordnance space weapons in order to retain the tractor beam from the Victory-1 and add iron cannon batteries like the Victory-2. Designing ships to carry laser-based weaponry was the preferred doctrine of the Empire at this point, although, as you will see later, Later, they would still experiment with missile launchers. The ISD-1 was seen as the epitome of Imperial strength, as it should have been. An impressive fighter complement, impressive armor, and a deadly armament grant the ISD-1 a position that only its successors can surpass. For that, the ISD-1 is mid-B tier. This following Star Destroyer was a variant of the original ISD-1, the Tector Star Destroyer.
As enemies of the Empire began to organize, Emperor Palpatine looked for solutions to decimate any form of morale his opponents may have. As followers of the Tarkin Doctrine, the Empire decided to increase the firepower of an ISD-1 in order to obliterate large targets with no resistance. In order to increase the destructive power of an ISD-1 even more, the hangars were removed and the ship was up-armoured, as well as sacrificing iron cannons and anti-fighter guns for even more turbo lasers. While the Tector undoubtedly had more firepower than the ISD-1, the Tector could still struggle against well-shielded vessels like the ones from Mon Cala. The Tector Star Destroyer was an intimidating vessel, but did require an escort. An ISD is supposed to be a ship that can cover all aspects of combat, and the Tector leans too heavily into capital ship combat, meaning it's not a very flexible ship despite its deadly weapons, and for that reason, it gets the lowest ranking, D tier. Whilst the Galactic Civil War was in full swing, the developers for the Kuat Drive Yards kept innovating. Their efforts led to an upgraded Star Destroyer, the ISD-2. The ISD-2 was nearly a direct improvement, for it had better armor, shields, accuracy, power reserves, and almost double the firepower of an ISD-1. The only sacrifices made were the removal of most small weapons and the subtraction of the tractor beam. Whilst not having much anti-fighter weaponry on board besides the fighter complement, the ISD-2 had an upgrade targeting system that allowed for precision firing. Although this ship cannot defeat a swarm of fighters, it could still cause any enemy to hesitate before engaging. For all of these ships' capabilities, we have to give it a high B rank. Whilst Palpatine was constructing Super Star Destroyers like the Executor, larger and improved versions of existing ships were manufactured. The Allegiance Battlecruiser became the result of making an up-armoured and extremely heavily armed weapons platform. The multi-level terracing design on the hull provided more effective real estate for turbo lasers and laser cannons. This increased the ship's maximum firepower by roughly 50%. The bridge was also redesigned to be less exposed, but still retaining the signature KDY bridge style, a T-shape with two spherical shield projectors on top. Due to the advancements in design, it was decided this ship would focus exclusively on firepower and armor, sacrificing any fighter complement. Its size and purpose granted this vessel the designation of a heavy Star Destroyer. From bow to stern, the Allegiance is 22,200 meters long, which is 50% larger than an ISD-1. For comparison to an SSD, the Executor was 19,000 meters long, or about 1,100% larger than an ISD-1. The Allegiance Battlecruiser brought the most firepower and armor out of all of the ships on this list. Whilst it does lack hangars, it can provide itself with moderate anti-fighter protection with its laser cannon armament. If any one Star Destroyer were to engage this heavy warship, it would likely not survive. For these reasons, we rank this ship mid-A tier. This next warship operates vastly differently than all other Star Destroyers we've talked about so far. It's none other than the Interdictor Class Star Destroyer, and it's visually distinct with its gravity well projector bulbs but it still maintained that classic pizza slice design seen with the ISD-1. The purpose of these bulbs was to generate an artificial gravity well, which could prevent ships from entering hyperspace. In later years, this technology would be adapted to bring friendly forces out of hyperspace with precision, but would maintain its irreplaceable main function as a tool to prevent enemies' retreat. To accommodate these massive gravity well generators, a large proportion of the Star Destroyer's guns were sacrificed, as well as reducing hangar capacity from 72 to 16 ties. 
While the Interdictor was outstanding in its own right, it sacrificed so much combat effectiveness in order to achieve its unique abilities. So, whilst this ship could bring the Rebellion to its knees, it would have been impossible to do so without support. And it would likely lose a one-on-one -on -one fight with most Star Destroyers on this list. Not to mention it has a comparatively reduced capacity to operate without enforcements. So, despite its amazing niche usefulness, we do have to rank the Interdictor on D tier. This next ship is starkly different from all other Star Destroyers, and not just because it's far and away the fastest destroyer. The Bakura class Star Destroyer was developed independently by Bakuran planetary forces during the oppressive reign of the Empire. The ship was less than 900 meters long, making it the second smallest Star Destroyer. Since the ship was manufactured during the Imperial rule, Bakuran engineers took a power reactor from an ISD-2 and housed it in a ship half of its size it was intended for. The Bakuran, although lightly armored, has exceptional shielding for its size and devastating firepower, contingent on it being able to stay alive. The super advanced reactor afforded more than just increased firepower and shielding. It also allowed for the most powerful engines in the galaxy. The Bakura class Star Destroyer used an array of hyperspace thrusters in conjunction with its reactor core to overload one engine bay at a time. By overloading one thruster, the Bakuran could jump out of the interdiction range, meaning it could never be trapped in engagement as long as its engines were still operational. By having an array of thrusters, this vessel could break through multiple interdiction fields if necessary. However, this came at the cost of needing to repair all overloaded thrusters. But even without this unique ability, the Bakuran could run blockades thanks to its unmatched speed and durable shields. The Bakuran was more geared for fighting similarly sized ships and would require backup if it was to handily defeat a larger Star Destroyer. It would excel much more in smaller engagements as it was outfitted with a moderate hangar space and several tractor beams. The Bakura class Star Destroyer was unlike any other destroyer of its time. However, its rarity and difficult to produce relegates this ship to the C tier. The last iteration of the Victory Star Destroyer is none other than the Harrow Star Destroyer. The Harrow had upgraded laser cannons and a small hangar to protect itself against starfighters, but its main purpose was to disable larger ships while supporting a fleet. The Harrow seemed to be a compromise between the Victory 1 and 2. Instead of keeping the iron cannons from the Victory 2, they were substituted for iron missiles and were situated in the same locations as the Victory 1. Whilst the ship excelled in causing damage, its finishing power left a lot to be desired. Its shielding was improved, but the engines were actually downgraded as speed was no longer so necessary. This was the case at least in the mind of Imperial officers. The Harrow class was the latest model of the Victory, but failed to make massive improvements over its predecessors. Due to the effectiveness of the Victory 1 and 2, subsequent attempts to improve the ship model were scrapped, as it was not seen a worthwhile investment. Overall, the Harrow falls into the C tier. This next Star Destroyer is also visually distinct, but focuses on combat effectiveness. The Peltus class Star Destroyer featured heavy weapons, including Mega Mazers and a Super Iron Cannon. The ship was designed jointly between the Empire and the Chiss Ascendancy, which provided the designers with a larger variety of weapons to pick from. The Mega Mazers aboard the Peltus were upscaled Mazers, which are similar to lasers. The Mega Mazers, in conjunction with the Super Iron Cannon, made the Peltus a massive force to be reckoned with. Its moderate size and devastating firepower gave it an edge in combat. The downside of the ship's great firepower, however, is that the Iron Cannon had exceedingly low rates of fire, with every shot requiring a recharge of several minutes. The Peltus did not take an absorbent amount of resources to produce and also carried several fighter squadrons as protection. But whilst the Peltus has a devastating volley and fighter complement, it lacks starfighter guns on the hull. Yet taking everything into consideration, this ship has to make the high B tier. Continuing the trend of Star Destroyers made by factions other than the Empire, the Nebula Star Destroyer was produced by the New Republic to effectively counter the ISD-2.
The Nebula Star Destroyer was barely bigger than a Venator but could produce more firepower and an equal amount of fighters to an ISD-2. The New Republic took the best design aspects from the Empire's capital ships but refused to compromise survivability for firepower. Although the Nebula was significantly smaller than the Imperial Star Destroyers, it was still very well shielded and also did not sacrifice any anti-fighter capabilities. In addition to its array of heavy guns and missile launchers, it also housed multiple tractor beams and lateral thrusters, allowing the Nebula to outmaneuver almost any other capital ship. The Nebula Star Destroyer outclassed most ships of its time, combining adequate fighter support, advanced shielding, high maneuverability, and heavy firepower. This ship ultimately achieved its design goal of being a capable match to the ISD-2 with flying colors. The Nebula suffers no significant weaknesses, and therefore it achieves a high ranking of A tier. The other major Star Destroyer produced by the New Republic was the Endurance Star Destroyer. This capital ship was meant to complement the Nebula Star Destroyer in the same way Venators complemented Victory Star Destroyers. Whilst the Endurance was based off the Nebula and still carried substantial firepower, it was heavily geared towards supporting a fleet with fighter cover and sensors. This ship was the same size as the Nebula but carried larger hangars, allowing numerous gunships and starfighters to launch. The Endurance had upgraded sensors and armor to provide a base of command during engagements. However, this came at the cost of advanced shielding. Unfortunately, Star Destroyers of its era could easily outdamage the Endurance, but its advantage was in the type of fighters it was designed to carry. Highly advanced E-Wing fighters and K-Wing bombers specialized in causing damage to large targets. Small A-Wings were also used to high effectiveness during dogfighting, especially if the Endurance's anti-fighter guns were in range. One might describe the Endurance as a pocket secutor, considering it was designed as a fleet carrier command ship. Although it was half the size of a secutor Star Destroyer, it was an improvement in almost every way. And thanks to its advanced fighter complement, we believe this Star Destroyer is the most capable vessel for engaging a fleet on its own. And since the Endurance Star Destroyer was relatively reproducible, it earns the top spot in our list, the S tier. The penultimate vessel on this list would be the Saranan class Star Destroyer, otherwise known as the EXF. The Saranon was used as a testbed for new weapons technology, whilst using a Star Destroyer layout for proof of concept. Whilst the experimental testbed version would change hands, the Saranon would serve the Imperial Remnant primarily against the New Republic. It wasn't particularly a big ship, roughly larger than a Venator, but it held a much more powerful reactor. It housed an antimatter containment chamber that was used to turbocharge the reactor, giving it increased speed, firepower, and shields. The antimatter chamber was a double-edged sword, unfortunately. If the chamber was breached, it would cause an explosion large enough to detonate the ship and the entire area surrounding it. To compensate for this significant weakness, the Saranon had reinforced armor. Although its size was not impressive, it had the presence of a larger ship and could take hits and deal them out twice as hard. It was a well-rounded ship seemingly designed for frontline combat, although its tendency to detonate made it a liability in formations. But there is no doubt this is the most advanced Star Destroyer to date so we rank the Sauron class a low A tier. Our final ship is none other than the Prosecutor Star Destroyer. Years after the original ISD was manufactured, the Prosecutor was designed as a forward skirmisher. Barely larger than the Venator Star Destroyer, the Prosecutor became a smaller, equally heavily armed ISD. The hull kept its shape for most part, but the guns were rearranged to allow for maximum damage output against small and large crafts. Small design flaws were improved, like the overly exposed bridge and lack of anti-fighter weaponry, and all these weapons came at the cost of hangar space, reinforcing the idea of it being exclusively fire support. The Prosecutor was used as an escort for heavier ships who required support in large-scale battles. It was relatively maneuverable for a Star Destroyer, and in formations, this vessel could decimate large and small targets. Unfortunately, as previously stated, this ship's main purpose is fire support, which almost necessitates 
reinforcements. The Prosecator is a dangerous foe, but can be bested. Due to its ease of production, this ship still makes to the low B tier ranking. So, did you agree with our rankings? We'd love to hear your arguments in the comments down below. Remember to like the video, and if you want a part 2 or a different style tier list, let me know in the comments also. But besides that guys, I've been Charlie, you've been watching X2, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.